Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on what happens after fighting ends. So you and I are involved in a civil war, we fight for a while, we negotiate a settlement. What happens next? Well, what we're going to see is bad things happen, and as a result, instead of negotiating that settlement, we're going to be continuing fighting for much longer than we would be otherwise. So let's start with a little bit of review. Remember back to that lecture on the principle of convergence. We learned that war transmits information. War perhaps starts because there's uncertainty about my strength or my resolve over a situation, but me rejecting offers reveals my strength and reveals my resolve, and also us fighting and you seeing what happens on the battlefield, that's also going to update your beliefs about how strong I am. If you're seeing me winning a lot, that's going to force you to update your beliefs and maybe you weren't as strong as you might have thought you were before the war started. So over time, we're going to see the information problem get resolved, that uncertainty is going to disappear, and once war loses its informational relevance, we see settlement, and that's because there are costs of war, and so if you know what the likely outcome of war is, you can settle and save on those costs. But when we look at the empirical application of this, we see that there's a bit of a discrepancy. So it's actually true that this theory works very well if you look at interstate wars. This is a war between one country and another country. We see that 55% of interstate wars end a negotiated settlement, at least according to the study that I'll be putting in the video description for this. Now, that number does change based off of how the particular writer codes what a war is and what a negotiated settlement is versus complete military defeat of one side. But either way, it's consistent across data sets that interstate wars, a majority of interstate wars, end in negotiated settlement. Now, that's in contrast to what happens with civil wars. In the study that I'm citing, and again, that's in the video description, we see that only 20% of civil wars end in negotiated settlement. So a substantial majority of these civil wars are ending in complete military defeat of one side. And again, that's going to vary from study to study, depending upon how the guy running the data set coded things. But we do see this significant and substantively important difference between the probability of settlement in an interstate war versus the probability of settlement in a civil war. So what's going on here? What is explaining this discrepancy. Why aren't these parties involved in civil wars understanding what's going on through the principle of convergence and coming up with a negotiated settlement? Well, the issue is a matter of commitment and enforceability of a settlement. Settlements in civil wars often ask for the combatants to do what they perceive to be the unthinkable, give up weapons in the absence of a credible enforcer. So in the United States, if you were to come up with some sort of agreement, because we are in a great democracy with a great rule of law, if someone violates an agreement that you come up with, you can go to court and challenge so that the court forces the other side to do what they're supposed to do. You can't do this in a newfound state, a state that just recovered from a civil war, because they don't have that established rule of law. The only thing that is actually enforcing a deal is your arms. And once you give up those arms, well, now you're in trouble. Because you don't have any arms to back up the agreement, it might be very easy for the other side to renege. And so as a result, rather than getting yourself involved in the agreement in the first place, you're just continuing to fight the war. And you'll be continuing to do that until one side is completely defeated militarily. And we can actually see this through that same commitment problem model that we looked at previously. So this is the same model in terms of the payoffs and the moves. All I've done is change the labels. So imagine that you're the rebel group and you realize that the government is probably going to be the one to win the war eventually. And so the government's trying to get you to settle with them. You can either continue fighting or make peace. Well, while you might want to make peace and hope that the government follows through, once you give up your weapons as the rebel group, the government has no reason to follow through on the agreement. It can renege and do better for itself. And because you know, as the rebels, you anticipate that the government is going to renege on the offer, you continue fighting, despite the fact that fighting is costly for both parties. And we can see that because if you look at the payoffs for following through on the peaceful agreement, both sides do better in that case than if the rebels continue to fight. But as the rebel group, if you're continuing to fight and you do manage to overturn things, so now it looks like you are going to be the likely winner of the war, well, we switch the sides around. Now the 
government is the one who's losing. The rebels are the ones who have to continue or to, to consider whether to follow through or renege on an agreement. And we see now that the government is in that same position as the rebels were before, where the government would like to make peace and reach a settlement that both sides prefer to fighting. But because the rebels have this incentive to renege and go back on the agreement, and perhaps if you're the government... Well, that means the rebels might execute you if you're the leader. Because these things are really bad for you, you're going to continue fighting. So we see that the main problem here is that power controls the distribution of a settlement. Whenever we're talking about negotiated agreements that are leaving both sides better off than fighting, we're centering those agreements around the distribution of power. But peace in civil war often requires disarmament, which changes the distribution of power. So where the bargaining range existed before the settlement was implemented is going to be different than where the bargaining, uh, bargaining range lies after the settlement takes place, because one side is giving up its arms. Now, this is a problem because power is indivisible in that way, or at least it's very very difficult to divide in an appropriate way. So a solution to this might be to come up with some way of making sure that the rebel group is maintaining some arms and is able to enforce some sort of treaty because of those arms. But when you're talking about a government to be a well-functioning government, it's very difficult to have both a rebel group still armed and be a well-functioning government. These kinds of things are very difficult. And as a result, we're in this, this huge problem. Now, this is not true. This, this problem does not exist in the realm of interstate war. Why is that? Well, after an interstate war, both states maintain their military power. Country A fights country B. They come up with a negotiated settlement. Both of those countries still exist, and they both maintain their military power. And so if one side were to try to break the agreement after it was agreed upon, well, now we're going back to fighting. And because fighting is costly and because we were very careful in our original agreement to make sure that the agreement fell within that bargaining range, well, if you go back to fighting, you're going to be getting something relatively close to what the negotiated settlement was, but now you're paying the cost. So that's bad for you. This is why we see a majority of interstate wars ending a negotiated agreement, because these sorts of agreements can be upheld and can withstand the test of time, whereas they can't really or not as easily be upheld over time in the realm of civil wars. But there is a potential solution, and I will be talking about that potential solution in the next lecture when we talk about third-party enforcement. Hope you enjoyed this and hope to see you next time. Take care.